So hello and welcome to our um, Barbus webinar series today. We are presenting uh, our, um, our episode on uh, one essay to rule them all. And we will show you why exome analysis is ready to replace NGS panels and conventional C and V detection methods in routine if the right tools are used. For this, um, we have three uh, speakers invited here. So the webinar is divided in three parts. The first one is on uh, supreme target enrichment by Twist Bioscience. The second part is on the validated software solution presented by Limbus Medical Technologies. And the third part is a clinical expert showing you how he uses these tools in exome diagnostics and routine. We will conclude with a Q&A session. So you're all very welcome to ask all questions you have in mind. But uh, to do so, depending on the setup you're using, if you have a um, desk and you're working on a desktop, uh, you have a, a webinar control panel. So click on this panel and open the questions tab here. And then you can type in your question. When you're uh, using a mobile device, you can click on the question mark icon and the questions panel will open and you can write in your questions there. Um, before we get started with the interesting part, just one uh, slide to briefly introduce to you who we are as we are hosting this webinar today. So I'm Yvonne Kassmann from Limbus Medical Technologies and we are a software development company located in the north of Germany, right at the Baltic Sea, as you can see on this map. We are a medical device manufacturer, which means that we um, develop and operate our products according to uh, international medical device standards. Our product, Barvis, is cloud-based and a clinical decision support system and um, can be used to analyze all uh, sort of NGS data from panels up to whole exome sequencing. And this is what our uh, webinar is about today. So as the first uh, speaker, I'm happy to introduce to you um, Dr. Jochen Segevis from Twist Bioscience with a talk about uh, supreme target enrichment, why uniformity is key. Um, Jochen, are you there? So to I'm introduce there. you all, you can switch on your camera if you want. Oh, there you are. Hi. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to introduce to you all Dr. Jochen Segevis. <coughs> he did a PhD in microbiology. And from 2008 to 14, he was the head of the genomics division of the Integrated Functional Genomics Core Unit at the University of Münster. He then uh, turned to uh, uh, the Institute of Human Genetics, where he was responsible for the development of the Diagnostic NGS Laboratory, also at the University of Münster. Since May this year, he's uh, working at the at Swiss Bioscience, um, and his role is there. He's an NGS sales specialist to support sales team and the uh, so I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and um, thank you to Limbus and especially Ben Liesfeld for the opportunity to present our solutions and um, show how, how Twist technology can support your research and diagnostics. Um, so, okay. Um, TWIST was already founded in 2013 by Emily LeProust and uh, colleagues, but um, we still feel as a startup, even if we are now a 2.5 billion euro um, company today. Um, we have offices in San Francisco, Tel Aviv, San Diego, Singapore, and uh, we are still constantly growing. So what can TWIST do for you? We have different uh, business divisions or business units. We um, can support you with genes or gene fragments, oligopools, libraries. Um, we will, today we will talk about NGS. We have a data storage uh, division. Um, for perhaps some of you know the um, Netflix series Biohackers, uh, which is stored totally in DNA. If you search on YouTube for biohackers and DNA storage, you would find a, a small um, movie how, how it is done. And we have a very new um, business unit, Twist Biopharma. But today we are talking about NGS. So <clears throat> this is our library prep, just a short summary. 
um, the DNA can be um, fragmented enzymatically or mechanically. And after that, um, you are certainly um, aware of the sequential uh, arrangements of the different steps. You have an end repair, an A tailing, and then our universal adapters are ligated. And this is um, a very um, optimized step so that you will get a very high complex uh, library, which would lead to or will lead to a very low duplication rate and a high complex um, library. And after that um, ligation of the universal adapters, the barcodes or um, yeah, UDIs are introduced by a PCR. And this was then already the first step of the library preparation, or that was the library preparation. And now the target enrichment follows. Um, this is also not rocket science. The steps are, are very similar to, to other protocols. We have the prepped library fragments from the library preparation. And then we block the um, universal, uh, yeah, the universal adapters and the repetitive sequences with our universal blockers and COD1 DNA. Then you can hybridize um, the library with our twist double-stranded DNA probes. This is, this is very special. We have double-stranded DNA probes, which means that you would will capture both strands, the forward and the reverse strand. And this is a an, uh, an big advantage compared to, for example, single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA, where you would only capture one of the strands. Um, then, um, after hybridization, the, um, the target sequences are captured or fished by Steptevadelian beads, and um, then you have your sequencing uh, ready library. We have a very flexible um, uh, kit. Um, kit um, yeah, we have a very flexible workflow for our kits. You can do, do an enzymatic fragmentation, as already told, or a mechanical fragmentation. Then we have two kinds of adapters, the CD adapters and the UDI adapters, of which we have approximately 400, and which uh, most customers use. We then have a standard enrichment with a 16-hour uh, hybridization or overnight hybridization, and a fast enrichment reagent kit uh, where the uh, in hybridization can be done within 15 minutes to four hours. And at the end, we have catalog panels or and uh, custom panels, and um, we are very proud of our custom panels because um, of, of our technology, which I will explain in a few minutes. Um, we are very flexible with the uh, custom panels and we um, can produce these custom panels in a very high quality uh, for a very reasonable price. Um, the kits include the universal blockers and also the enrichment beads. That means you don't have to spend any uh, additional money on, for example, MPO beads. Um, flexibility uh, means that you can, for example, use the enrichment fragmentation kit with the UDI adapters, the standard enrichment and custom panel, for example. But um, so as you have seen, the, the library prep itself and the enrichment is not rock science. Um, I already mentioned that uh, our, our ligation step is very, very um, optimized and highly efficient. But uh, what's the main or what are the other advantages of TWIST? In 2014, um, researchers identified that there's a, a gap between um, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing, as you can see here, um, to get uh, to, to reach the same sensitivity with whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. You have to spend much more, um, um, or you have to to to, to get a, a higher sequencing depth for whole exome sequencing to get the, the same uh, sequencing sensitivity. And um, why, why is that? Why do we have that gap? Um, for example, you can see here, if you, you, you have these curves or waves over your targets, and if you want to reach uh, a 30x coverage or sequencing depth, you always, always have targets uh, which, which fulfill these, these needs. But you also have um, oversequence targets like uh, the, the um, second curve, where you spend uh, much more sequencing throughput on that target as you would, would need. And you always have undersequenced targets um, where the sequencing depth, for example, is not uh, high enough for a clinical analysis. And you have off target regions. 
and all these, the over-sequenced, uh, the under-sequenced, and the off-target regions are wasted, uh, wasted sequencing data. And what we, or our aim was, and we reached that aim, that we have the same, um, the same uniform, uniformity uh, for whole exome sequencing, like for whole genome sequencing, which means that there is no, no gap. Here you can see we reached the same sensitivity of 95% for whole genome sequencing, with a sequencing depth of 15, and with our exome with a sequencing depth of on, uh, approximately 16. And of course, we have to spend much less sequencing throughput on a whole exome sequencing than for a whole genome sequencing. So you spend, uh, you, you save a lot of money by that. Um, and our, our performance is really uh, extraordinary. We have an off-target rate of approximately 15% here for an exome. We have a very low duplication rate, which means that, um, again, that you have to spend less sequencing throughput on, on, uh, on your sample. And we have a very high uniformity here um, shown by this a very low F80 value. And how is it done? Well, we have a very special proprietary um, uh, technology, disruptive technology of, of DNA synthesis, of oligosynthesis. And as shown here, on the same space where others uh, use a 96 well plate uh, and produce approximately one gene, we can use up to 9,600 genes. Um, combining the the uh, silicon wafer technology or printing technology known from from silicon wafers, for example, for for uh, um, yeah, computer CPUs um, and the traditional um, oligosynthesis chemistry. So we we produce our oligos in very very small volumes, which makes it uh, on one hand very cost uh, effective. On the other hand, very, very uh, controlled and uh, very fast, much faster than in these uh, 96 well plates. The 96 well plates uh, are very effective, but uh, slow and, and expensive. And that's the reason why a lot of other companies um, like to sell catalog products, because they can produce in, in bigger amounts, um, because they don't have this flexibility, which we have on the silicon um, platform. So we are very flexible, even with with smaller custom panels. So for us, it makes no difference if we produce a big panel or a small panel or an, a catalog exome. Um, there's also array-based oligosynthesis, um, which is more flexible, but uh, they sometimes have problems with a lot of lot variability, which we don't see with our, um, yeah, our method. As said, we use the standard uh, oligosynthesis chemistry and um, after this uh, synthesis, uh, for, for most uh, methods, the, the uniformity of the GC content from low to high GC content is very even, if, as it is shown um, here at the, at the um, top of the slide. <clears throat> so this is good, and, and, but uh, the amount of oligos which is produced at that step is not enough to, to sell it to the, to the customer or to use it for, for several uh, experiments. So this oligo pool has to be amplified. And that's another big advantage besides the ligation and the, the silicon wafer technology we use. We have a very sophisticated uh, proprietary um, method to amplify this DNA, which, uh, which um, keeps the uniformity of the whole GC content, as shown on the right. Um, with standard amplification methods uh, shown on the left, you, you introduce an amplification bias uh, to the oligos. And some oligos um, have a higher amplification efficiency and some lower. And all the oligos with a higher um, amplification uh, efficiency um, are responsible for these over-sequenced um, targets. Because when you have more oligos of these targets, you will capture more of these targets and then sequence more of these targets and you have over-sequencing. The, the um, probes, which are, have a, a very low um, PCR or amplification efficiency, um, of these you will have, have only uh, very few in, in your final oligo pool. And because of that, you will only uh, capture some of them and you have these under sequence regions. And with our technology, where we um, yeah, keep this uniformity of the whole um, probe pool. We also, of course, at the end can keep or can get a very 
high uniformity on the targets. We don't have this over sequencing and under sequencing. And that means you can, at the end, um, because you don't waste so much sequencing capacity, you can save money by just uh, adding more samples to the sequencing run. Um, you can save up, uh, up to half of the costs, or you could sequence the same number of samples, but with a much higher sequencing depth if you want to. So that's a really, really big advantage. And of course, these, um, these uh, very good uniformity helps you for CNV analysis, which we will hear about later. Because if you have a more um, even distribution, then uh, the CNV uh, algorithm will work better. So um, we, we have a very extensive quality control of all our probes. Um, we do an NGS sequencing of each lot we produce for custom panels and for catalog panels. For both, of course, um, others do not. And if you miss um, probes, you will, of course, not capture these targets. And uh, from my experience in, in the lab or in the diagnostics, I know that always the missing exon or the missing gene is the one which uh, which carries the, uh, the variant you want to find. So it's uh, not nice to 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 uh, to uh, uh, if if not all exons are included. But we we check this by by NGS and we can guarantee that all all the probes are present. And we by this uh, QC we also check the the number of probes available in our pool. And here on the left is shown an, an, um, yeah, an oligopool or a panel which passes a QC. We have a very, very even frequency, uh, very, um, yeah, frequency of, of, uh, of the pool, um, and which would lead to, to a very uniform coverage. On the right, you see that there is some, some bias. We have a drop towards a high GC content, and this panel would be reproduced or optimized, but not sold to the customer. Now let's talk about our exome shortly. Um, I already, already mentioned our very low uh, duplication rate, which leads uh, to, to uh, uh, yeah, you, you have to spend less sequencing throughput because you don't have so much, much wasted data by duplicates. And we really have a, a very low duplication rate here in this example of 2% um, compared to competitors. And one or well, another advantage of our, our protocol and our products is that they are very flexible. There's a special um, step uh, in the protocol uh, which, uh, which enables you to add uh, custom content even to our catalog exome. So you could add special clinical content. You could add uh, more probes for CNV detection for special genes or for the whole exome. You could add uh, probes for UTRs or any other custom content very easily. So you could add additional content or enhanced content, which means you could add more probes for a special gene uh, in, in which we want to identify mosaics, for, for example. Our exome is very comprehensive. Um, we have all RevSeq CDS uh, included, plus um, regions from CCDS and GenCode. Um, so it's a very comprehensive one, which uh, is used by a lot of customers, even for diagnostic purposes. And all the advantages I already mentioned for our exome are also valid for custom exomes. As said, by our, our uh, silicon wafer technology, we can produce custom panels um, uh, with the same quality and, and very high flexibility um, as for, for the exomes. Um, if you are interested in a custom panel, you would just send us an, a gene list or even better, an, an, a list with genomic coordinates. And within two days, you should get back your design file. It's a bed file where you can check if all the um, targets are included. And if we have, you're okay to produce that, um, that custom panel, we only need two to three weeks turnaround time until you have your customized flexible panel in hand. And um, for example, I, I already mentioned uh, the step in which you could uh, add spike in, um, a spike in panel to our, to our uh, exome. 
it would also be possible to combine two, two uh, custom panels, for example, if you have a custom panel for breast cancer and another one for colorectal cancer and you have a patient which unfortunately uh, suffers in both, you could in the protocol combine these two, um, these two panels and only have to sequence that patient one time and not two times for the different panels. Um, as you can see here, our very high uniformity, so um, uh, shown by these low F80 values um, and the very low duplication rate, um, yeah, uh, are, are shown for different sizes of, of, of custom panels. Here we have a very small panel of se uh, 17 KB up to a very uh, or a bigger panel of 13 MB at the bottom, and uh, the uniformity and the duplication rate are very low for all these panels. So our, our uh, extraordinary performance is not only valid for the exome, but also for all kinds of, of custom panels. And these are uh, unoptimized panel versions. So um, yeah, it's, it's uh, very, very um, performant uh, just from scratch. So, just let me give a very short summary. Uh, we have a very high uniformity, which leads to a significant reduction in sequencing costs um, because we can sequence more samples in the same sequencing run, or you can get a, a higher sequencing depth for the same number of samples. Um, you don't have gaps, so you uh, don't have to do any single sequencing. And this high uh, uniformity. Um, yeah, it makes it possible to, to perform a reliable um, CNV analysis with your software pipeline. We have this flexibility, which means you can simply add or boost existing uh, content with spike ins, or you can uh, yeah, get a uh, deeper sequencing uh, uh, or higher sequencing coverage for special regions. We have a very uh, flexible modular workflow for enzymatic fragmentation or mechanical fragmentation for fast type or standard type. And um, we are very fast. We have a turnaround time of only two to three weeks for a customized, very flexible panel. And um, we, we have a single day hybridization workflow with a fast um, hybridization workflow. And we perform uh, NGS, a QC by NGS for every lot, for every custom panel and for all uh, catalog panels, of course, so that we have a very, um, uh, yeah, a very um, reproducible uniformity from lot to lot. Uh, which is very important uh, for, for clinical uh, questions. So I think that's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for this interesting talk. I want to like to take the opportunity to ask the first question that was already raised in our chat. Is the fragmentation enzyme included in the kit? Yes, that's, that's included in the kit. And that's also compatible with, uh, for example, problematic uh, material like DNA, uh, DNA from FFPE material. So it's included. Ah, okay. Great. Okay, I would like to, again, uh, encourage everybody to ask questions in the chat. Um, also, uh, for um, Jochen Zegevis, um, we have the Q&A uh, session at the end, so we can we see you again later for more questions. Thank you. So with this, I would like to uh, continue with our second uh, speaker. So the second part is on the validated CNV analysis from WES, results you can trust, presented by Dr. Ben Liesfeld from Medical, Lemus Medical Technologies. So I'm introducing to you Ben. He does a PhD in physics. From 2008 to 13, he was working at, in a startup for ophthalmological medical devices where he was developing computer-guided laser surgery devices. Uh, 2013 to 14, he was in a, working at a clinical laboratory for genetic diagnostics, where his responsibility was to establish IT software development and bioinformatics department. This is also where he first got in touch with um, NGS data analysis, uh, also learned about the huge challenges and um, potential analyzing this uh, kind of data. And this led him to found uh, his own enterprise. So he, now he's the Managing Director of Nimbus Medical Technologies, and um, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Yvonne, for the introduction. 
So I'm, I'm going to talk um, or give you an, a view of from the software side, we are contributing the, the software solution to, to, the, uh, to the workflow. And I'm focusing specifically on how you validate the results, how you validate the, the output of the software. Um, let me first talk about briefly um, what uh, our software actually does. Varvis, uh, that's the name of our software, is a cloud native medical device uh, software. That means uh, there's no investment necessary to get started. Uh, we provide you with the info, uh, IT infrastructure and it, um, no matter how many samples you're processing per day, we can uh, accommodate you. We can provide equal performance and support across the globe. It's available from any point in the world. And we can also provide you with immediate quality control feedback, which um, allows you to optimize the laboratory process. And this is quite important to achieve optimum results in the CNV analysis. It scales well from small panels, even to whole genome sequencing. And of course, having an automated CNV analysis saves you time and money because you don't have to perform any additional uh, methods in the laboratory. Um, well, so why is, we are, we are um, focusing on validation so much, or we're talking so much about validation, why is validation so important? From our point of view, uh, validation is the prerequisite for automation. And we try to automate as much as possible. If you don't validate your essay, um, you probably have to examine every single result and determine if it's correct. It's very important to validate the, the essay so that you can take the, uh, the result as face value and uh, go on with the, uh, with the interpretation. Uh, another important aspect is there is a lot of regulation, in particular in Europe, that requires that genetic tests are validated. And last but not least, in particular in Germany, reimbursement is tied to validation. So uh, diagnostic tests that should be reimbursed must be validated first. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on the validation process and it's part of our onboarding process for our new customers. Our um, so um, customers or um, um, laboratories who are interested in evaluating our software typically do so and compare our software with existing solutions they typically test our software using their own data and this is basically an opportunity for us to provide feedback regarding quality control, regarding the quality of the data. Um, we can assess intersample and inter run variability and at that point we can already predict how these essays will perform in any validation process. And in a third step we actually perform the validation either on based on historic samples or based on, on our uh, own protocols. And the result is a complete validation report that can become part of the quality management system of the laboratory. And that means that you are basically all set before you even start performing the first routine diagnostic sample um, in the laboratory. Let us review some requirements of the validation process for the CNV analysis. If you compare um, the CNV analysis to what is available for the validation of small variants. Well, first of all, for small variants, there's a lot of reference material available. And this reference material has been uh, characterized using multiple methods. For example, the genome in a bottle samples. And uh, that means that your target in the validation process is typically um, to achieve a sensitivity in the range between 95 to 98%. So you don't even expect to match um, the results from the reference material because you're comparing a single method to a multitude of methods. It's quite different uh, when you look at the CNV validation. There is actually no um, suitable reference material available to perform CNV validation. Um, the reference material uh, methods that you're comparing to are typically ACGH or MLPA, depending on what you're uh, already performing in the lab. And your target is, or typically is, um, that you um, would like to achieve 100% sen sensitivity to either one of those methods. Your goal is typically to replace one of those methods. So let's talk about the key parameters that you obtain from the validation process. Um, you're comparing your own test to the result that you expect from the reference material. So you're typically counting true positives and false negatives. But if you're only focusing on um, on those variants that are uh, deviant from the 
from the wild type, you're missing out on a lot of information. You should also take it into account where the reference material is negative, so you can determine correctly the number of false positives, uh, false positive results, and the true negative results. Because when you're looking at the important um, um, performance parameters, uh, like the positive predictive value or the negative predictive value, um, false positive and true negative variants are very important. Uh, the positive predictive value will give you a number or a probability if you find a CNV, how, how likely is it that this CNV is actually true? And in turn, the negative predictive value tells you if your case is negative, how sure can you be that it is actually negative? We are uh, performing the validation at a very detailed level. We are comparing every, every single probe from the NGS um, assay to the reference method. So this is an example of a screenshot in the software of the NGS data of the LDLR gene and uh, we compare this to the result from MLPA for example. And in the validation process we match every single target region from the NGS assay to the respective probe in the MLPA. So this is really a head-to-head -head comparison of both methods and this is a suitable process to determine if you can replace the reference method. Um, this is an exemplary result from one of our customers. This is uh, obtained from whole exome sequencing. Um, we were analyzing 40 samples with known uh, variants. Uh, the important result or the important elements here are we achieve a very high negative predictive value, close to 100%. So we can be very sure that if a case is negative, it truly is negative. On the other hand, we see that the positive predictive value is lower for gains than for losses. This is typically expected. It is more difficult to clearly identify gains. The signal-to-noise ratio is just lower um, for gains. And we know, and uh, this is what we typically do, expanding the number, uh, the validation to a larger number of samples will narrow down the confidence intervals. And this is something that we offer to our customers as soon as new samples are available um, to, uh, to add to the validation pool, uh, we will do so and this improves uh, the performance uh, results in the validation report. So in the end, a laboratory that uh, uses such a validated uh, method can uh, typically perform uh, the CNV analysis on all samples. There's a very rigid quality control um, which samples can be included in the CNV analysis. Typically, according to our experience, three to five percent of samples don't uh, match up with those requirements, but the vast majority of samples can be analyzed. If you find um, um, uh, yeah, actionable uh, variants or relevant variants in your samples, you may be able to uh, confirm those with um, alternate methods, but the vast majority uh, in, um, of your samples will be negative for CNVs, and so you will be very quick to write a report. So this is kind of the, the general setting, what you have to do and uh, what you can achieve with, um, uh, with a CNV validation. But in real life, you will always find extraordinary results. There's just so much variability in, the, in human nature. And I just took a, 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 one of those sam examples and would like to explain to you um, what a good CNV analysis from NGS data can tell you about it. So an example of something that looks like a CNV, but the question is, is this really a CNV? Um, the example that, that I picked was um, was mentioned to us by a customer, and he was looking at the, uh, or he found a duplication, an apparent duplication in the MFF gene, but it was strange in such a way that um, there were several exons uh, seemed to be duplicated, but uh, some exons in the middle of the gene seemed to be wild type, and this was very uh, peculiar. Um, you don't see something like that very often. And um, so that's why we took a, a deeper look at the data. And when you look at, looked at the uh, read, uh, at the alignment of the on NGS reads, you could see that there were steep edges exactly at the borders of the exons. And um, when aligning one of those reads that did not perfectly match the intronic region, it turned out that uh, parts of the read uh, matched the sequence in one exon, and a part of the read matched the uh, exonic sequence in a neighboring exon. Quite quite peculiar. We uh, also looked at the data uh, utilizing the information from the paired end reads, 
And you could see that those paired end reads very fre frequently span the entire entronic regions between exons. And uh, so we had an idea that this uh, may have something to do with Zulu genes. And we um, investigated which uh, transcripts were uh, known for this uh, gene MFF. And uh, there were actually two different transcripts um, available in RefSec. And uh, so that's wh where, where we got the idea, well, this might have to do with Zulu genes. And just recapulate, recapitulating, uh, Zulu genes may be created by um, two different mechanisms in the human genome. There are unprocessed Zulu genes or processed Zulu genes. Um, uh, one of them is uh, an, uh, simply a duplication of the DNA sequence uh, of uh, functional genes in the genome, and the other is actually retrotransposition of mRNA into DNA again and back into the human genome, and this creates this peculiar sequence in the in the DNA sequence actually. And uh, when looking at the data, it exactly matches um, what is shown here. Um, the um, the three exons that exhibited or that showed wild type copy number of two um, are were not contained in the transcript in one of those transcripts and were missing from those from this transcript. So it uh, uh, matches the hypothesis that it was the uh, the shorter transcript that was reinserted into the human genome. And we thought, well, wow, what a rare event! Um, we we were so lucky to find something something like this. But uh, as it turns out, and uh, as our customer sequenced uh, or have sequenced now uh, many thousand whole exomes and performed CNV analysis on them, it turns out that those events are more frequent than you would think. And just to give you some numbers, um, there are more than 14,000 uh, Zulu genes known that, uh, that are part of the human reference assembly already. And there's a study um, that took the, the data from the 1KG project and identified 48 novel processed Zulu genes that are not part of the reference assembly. And they, um, uh, they hypothesized that one in every 6,000 6, individuals carries a novel um, heritable gene retrocopy, a processed Zulu gene. So it's not that rare, actually, if you sequence in a large number of patients. And you will probably um, encounter something like that when you're using whole exome sequencing in routine. I can uh, recommend to you some references if you'd like to read up on, on, on this topic a little more. Of course, we have a blog article about the topic. Um, there is an, a very good introduction into the, the process, how uh, Zulu genes are generated in the human, human genome. This is the study of the uh, 1KG data, investigating how many novel um, um, processed Zulu genes there are. And if you're also interested in the diagnostic aspects, there's an um, interesting paper from Wilson describing how those Zulu genes can confound conventional CNV de detection like MLPA and creates uh, some problems in clinical diagnostics. But as you can see, the uh, CNV data from NGS provides you with added value, with additional information that allows you to interpret, interpret those results correctly. Okay, Yvonne, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, there's also a question for you in the chat. Um, is there a minimum coverage for NGS required to be able to do reliable CNV analysis? Um, well, there are a number of quality criteria that we apply. One of them is um, also the depth of coverage. Um, for a twist exome, we recommend to uh, obtain about 150x average depth um, in order to achieve a sing single exon resolution with a CNV analysis. Okay, thank you, Ben. See you later. Okay. This I would like to introduce to you the third part of our webinar, Exome Diagnostics, the New Standard of Care, uh, with Professor Rami abu from the University of Leipzig Medical Center. Hello, Rami. Nice to have you here. I would like, so I would like to introduce to you all Rami abu -Zamura. He uh, studied medicine in Damascus 
completed his medical education in Bonn and gained further um, scientific and clinical experience in the following years in Erlangen and in Rostock. Since 2015, he is the head of the diagnostic department at the Institute of Genetics, University of Leipzig Medical Center, and his focus is on genetics of intellectual disability and the development of new applications for routine diagnostics. And today he will show some uh, nice uh, examples from the clinic, some cases, uh, how he uses uh, the twist exome and the Vava software to solve the cases. Welcome, Rami. And I think you're still on mute. Now, oh, hi, Yvonne. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm now in our kitchen, so um, if a child crosses over, don't um, panic. Uh, so, um, here's a disclaimer, very short. Um, I work at the University of uh, Leipzig. I want us to start with the uh, progress that we have in Leipzig. I have started at the end of 2015 and at that time we had practically no next generation sequencing. And at that time I thought um, we have the expertise of evaluation, uh, we just need to outsource um, the sequencing and uh, bioinformatic. And so we sourced both of them, bioinformatic to GeneWiz, and we directly um, started with the analysis. So at the beginning we had um, an epilepsy panel of like 130 genes. The cancer, breast cancer, was an established panel. We were doing like 250 a year. We started with the so-called, I'm calling it in the OMM. Um, here we are using TrueSight 1 from Illumina, but at the end doesn't matter. It's a big um, panel of all genes that are assumably clinically relevant, and we have done also some zooms. And um, the year after, we were able to grow very fast. Um, as I told you, because we have everything outsourced, so the epilepsy, we were doing a little bit more. Cancer was steady. We were doing like 500 omen panels and um, more than 100 exomes. An exome doesn't mean one sequencing, but it means like a case that is uh, usually a trio. And the year after, um, it was exploding with the omen panels. Um, epilepsy was going down because we were noticing that it doesn't make sense to make small panels. Exome was growing. And um, then we realized that exome is... Um, the, the much better um, answer for all questions. So OMEM was uh, not developing, but exome was getting more and more. And in this year, we are going to do 2,000 or more exome sequencing, and we are doing no OMEM panels anymore. The a bunch that are still there are the ones that we had at the beginning of the year as being sequenced last year. So as you see, we we moved to exome totally. We are doing the cancer uh, panel for this specific question. Otherwise, we are using only exome. So why we are doing that? The diagnostically yield is much higher. I'm putting here very rough two numbers that we have. If we are using a very big panel, as the, as an example, the Omen panel, which is about 5,000 genes, then we have a diagnostic yield of a little bit more than 25%. And this is taking across all over um, questions. If we are doing an exome, then we are getting between 10 and 20% more diagnostic yield than using a panel, although um, in this OMEN panel you should have all um, relevant genes, but indeed it's not. So the diagnostic yield is a known aspect and I think there's no need to have um, too much discussion on that, at least out of our point of view. But there are also other reasons why we are moving or why we have moved to doing exome diagnostic. One of them, it is rapid and it's all encompassing. I'm going to, to give you a practical example on that. We have this uh, child presented um, in the University of Leipzig, seven years old girl, and she was born in the 41st uh, gestation week. Birth weight, length, and head circumference were normal. Um, the milestones were uh, normal, um, the motor milestones were normal, but uh, um, uh, the speech was a little bit delayed. First words were with two years, and this delay in uh, development uh, was continuing. In addition, there was a muscle hypotonia, and at the age of like four years, it was um, clear that the child has a neurodevelopmental delay uh, that was clinically diagnosed. 
She has one cafe only a spot, which is not a rarity, and she has absolutely no other symptoms, um, no epilepsy, growth is unremarkable, there are no malformations or anomalies, she has no epilepsy, and, oh, um, I have written that, I'm sorry. So it was an isolated, mild developmental delay. What we have done in this case is performing a trioxome analysis, um, as you see in, in this case, and uh, what we have um, done afterwards is checking out the variants that we have identified. As you see, we have here, I'm sorry, it's not reacting, oops. Okay, so um, as you see here, we have um, in the left up corner, corner 80,000 variants that were identified in this case. Um, due to the exome analysis in the child and the parents. A huge number of cases that cannot be just um, evaluated very quickly. So what we often do is applying a so-called in silico panel. What we have established is the so-called morbid gene in silico panel. We have included in this panel genes that fulfill one of the following three criteria. Either it has a solid omen phenotype without a question remark, or there are more than three pathogenic variants in ClinBa, or there are th more than three pathogenic variants in HGMD. We established the pipeline, and it is pretty easy to see how this panel is developing. As we have applied this panel first time last year, 2019, there was 3,900 genes that were clinically relevant. At that, at this time, we are working with 4,000. 96 genes that we apply as the morbid gene panel. When, and that means that we are not analyzing all the 20,000 genes that are in exome, but only a quarter of them, the morbid genes, while the remaining genes are just left aside, at least for the first analysis step. That means in this case, we are not evaluating 80,000, but only a quarter of the cases of the variants, that is 20,000 variants, looks like if it's too much, but if you have an established filtering pipeline, then it's pretty easy. You need only one step. We are choosing variant that has a high or moderate impact on the protein. That means there are missense variants, stop variants, splicing variants. We take variants that have a, my, um, um, a moderate quality, so we don't look for high quality variants, but we also ignore low uh, quality variants that are probably artifacts. We are checking for de novo variants as it is the most common reason for intellectual disability or for developmental delay if the parents are not consanguineous. And we choose variants that, has, that have a prevalence of almost zero in the general population. We rarely go to zero because we think sometimes you have exceptions. And it took us like a second to click these four buttons and we have this variant in the gene SR, SRCAP. It's a de novo variant, so it's only in the child. Um, obviously, uh, a mosaic due to the allele frequency, but that is not um, um, majorly important now. Parents do not have it, and the quality is very good. The variant is um, uh, a frame shift, and we have now this report. As we are reporting, the variant in SR is RCAP. Frame shift is de novo, and it is not classified even as ACMG, and that's the reason why I'm telling it's not only rapid, but it's also all-encompassing, and that's it is very convincing. Um, the text of the report is interesting. We have found this variant, it's a frame shift in SRCAP, and there was a very recent report on variants in this gene that showed that depending on the kind of the variant or the location of the variant, you have three different phenotypes. Um, in the same gene. So if variants are um, a stop variant that are before the position 2380 uh, and 28, then you get um, the phenotype that we have in this child, which is um, an isolated developmental delay, a mild isolated developmental delay. If it's later than that, the stop variants, then you have a floating harbor syndrome, which is a very known syndrome, and if it is a gain of function variant, then you have a third phenotype. If we didn't do exome analysis, such a gene wouldn't have been thought to be causative because either you put it as a floating harbor gene 
or because you don't include it as it's very rare. So it's not only quick and rapid, but it's also all encompassing. Um, a very interesting aspect of the exome analysis um, is that we use it for copy number variants, even for the small ones. As Ben um, showed before, the um, tool is able to, um, Parvis is able to find uh, copy number variants, and I also support um, uh, my uh, the first speaker as uh, the quality of the twist exomes is better than the rest. Um, we are using also other kits and they work, but uh, we prefer to work with twist in these cases. This is an example of a tiny deletion, a child, two years old boy, born in the, third, in the 41st uh, gestation week, birth weight uh, was at the 97th percentile, length on the 88th percentile, and head circumference on the 65th percentile. There was um, problems in the neonatal adaptation, so we had to stay in the neonatology um, for a few days. The milestones were um, a little bit delayed, sitting was with 10, 11 months, walking 24 months, first words with 17 to 18 months. And at the time uh, we have seen the child at the age of two years, he could not um, use two word sentences. So he is developing, but also in this case, neurodevelopmental um, delay. And we have performed an exome analysis and we identified a deletion within the gene CAMTA1. It's not taking all the genes, so um, it was tough and actually not really possible to find it using an array diagnostic. But it is known that heterozygous exon deletions and this gene have been reported as pathogenic for a non-progradient cerebral ataxia with mental retardation and uh, we have uh, set the diagnosis in for this child. The matter of uh, CNV analysis um, is interesting for us as it's not only saving costs but it's also of higher quality and also much quicker than doing array analysis. We have done a retrospective validation. We have taken 81 samples that we have done array analysis for them. And we have extracted all variants of these samples. Um, and we checked if we would see these variants in the exome sequencing. And we find that out of the 111 copy number variants, we have seen 109 of these. And the missing two were one of them was in the pseudo-autosomal region, which was not analyzed. And um, that's indeed um, a point that must be uh, prepared and, and repaired. And another one, it was um, a large deletion, um, but includes only one exon. And that's the reason why we, we have seen this variant actually in the exome, but we uh, needed to know the data of the array in order to, to realize this is a deletion. Otherwise, we have put it as a uh, background noise. Um, on the other hand, we have found some variants in the exome that could not be identified in the array analysis. So at the end of the day, um, it didn't show that the array analysis was better. And now we are doing um, a prospective validation. Every sample that we get where we are doing both array and exome analysis, we compare between them and uh, we are finding all variants. So in the meanwhile, we have stopped array analysis and we are performing only CMV analysis based on exome diagnostic. So why exome? Um, it's not only, um, um, it doesn't, it has a higher diagnostic yield, it's rapid, it encompasses all genes, it's convincing as it finds deletions and duplications as well, and uh, which is a very important aspect actually for us, it supports research. Here's an example of a girl deceased at the age of one month. She had an infantile onset, onset of seizures in epileptic encephalopathy. Her sister deceased at the age of five days due to similar symptoms. So we were able to um, identify a homozygous uh, variant in a gene that's called GLS. And we have identified another family um, in our lab that has um, also homozygous variants in this gene and could identify a novel disorder uh, that is the glutamase, glutaminase deficiency that leads to lethal neonatal epileptic encephalopathy. And actually, although we are doing that in a diagnostic setting, we have contributed to the identification of about 30 different disorders 
as we are do, checking the data also on scientific base. And I encourage all of you to do that if you find that you do not have the capacity or the interest to do that. We're very, very happy in Leipzig um, to reanalyze or receive your data in order to funnel these in research studies. And now uh, the gene and the disorder are valid OMIM um, disorders and uh, they can be introduced and uh, included in future panels. Another aspect of the exome analysis is the dual diagnosis, which is um, a very important point. I'm showing you one example of a seven-year-old seven child. He has developmental delay, autism, microcephaly, and facial dysmorphisms. I don't have a picture as I don't have a consent for that, uh, for pictures. And we have identified in this child two de novo pathogenic variants in the, gene, in the genes TRIP12 and TRIO. Both variants are de novo, as I told you. Both of them are truncating and both of them are likely pathogenic based on the ACMG classification criteria. If we have done a panel and we have found one of these variants, we would have stopped as we think or we would think that if we are not clarifying all symptoms of the child, the remaining symptoms would be due to known variability in the phenotype and not because there is another phenotype in this child or in this patient. And uh, this example is not a rarity as you may think. I have checked all cases that we have where we have reported at least one variant back to the physician. Um, this is the data of more than 1,000 cases. So it's not, it's, it's all it's representative. And in 6% of the cases, we report back um, two variants or more. And when we are reporting back, we, we do not um, report back in, in, in um, um, too many variants. It's not that we every time see a variant which we are not sure of that and we report it back. We report back only variants where we are almost convinced or actually convinced that it's clinically relevant. So um, it's an important issue, this um, dual diagnosis aspect. And while we are talking about that, um, the secondary findings or the incidental findings, our policy in Leipzig is reporting back only pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in only the 59 genes that have been recommended by the ACMG um, for incidental findings. And, um, Although we are so conservative, we are reporting back in 3% of the cases a variant in one of these genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, many mutations or pathogenic variants in genes for arrhythmia or myo um, cardiomyopathies and so on, um, which is also an interesting aspect and um, practically every patient wants to know the incidental findings and I can understand that. Why exome? In addition, it solves tricky cases, um, even in very known genes. As an example, a one-year-old girl has focal epilepsy uh, with an age of onset in the third month of life. MRI is unremarkable, metabolic diagnosis unremarkable, family history negative. We have identified in this child um, variants in the PRRT2, um, and one of them is um, synonymous variant that is uh, practically irrelevant. And the other one is the very known duplication of um, the coding position 6, 4, 9, leading to a frame shift. However, this leads actually to a mild phenotype, and we would have expected to have this in the family. Um, if we were doing the normal diagnostic, we would have stopped at this uh, step. However, unluckily, the copy number variant analysis revealed that there is, in addition, a heterozygote deletion in this gene. And the deletion and the variant, the heterozygote variant here, are not overlapping. So it's not that we have seen that this variant looks like homozygous. We have seen it as heterozygous. And beside that, we have the PRRT deletion. We have checked the segregation. Um, this variant is inherited from the father. And this variant is de novo. They are um, compound heterozygous variants. and um, we had to give um, a less good diagnosis uh, and prognosis than we have expected, but a much more correct one. This is the final 
report. So taken together, I consider performing exome, and actually we should soon move to genome sequencing, as a first diagnostic set as um, a chance to do a good job, but also as a duty, as you can do it. So if you can do it, I think then you must do it so that you are fair to your patients. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or remarks, you can get back to me or also to Vardis. Thank you, Rami, for showing your clinical data in these interesting cases. I also have a question for you here in the chat. How long does it take you to review a whole exome case in, uh, in average? Um, well, if it takes you more than 15 minutes, then you are going into the risk of uh, reporting false positive results. So I would say like something between five and 15 minutes. And it's much easier if you have a trio, of course, but yeah, I would stick to five to 15 minutes. Okay. So then I would like to um, open the Q&A session to welcome back um, Ben and, and Jochen to this part. Um, there, there are more questions that have arrived in the chat. The first one is for um, Twist. Do the probe contain universal tags to allow for ampli amplification and sequencing? Um, I have another colleague of mine. I think she's in the call for answering technical questions. Tina, will you answer? Um, so the answer is no. Um, does it have a universal tag? Okay. And there's also a follow-up question. Uh, can you elaborate on the benefit of double-stranded probes? Both strands are represented in the library as most library preparation me methods involve PCR during library prep. Do you also want so, to take this, Tina? Yeah, sure. Um, so actually, um, we do have a double-stranded probe. That means we can capture the sense and antecedent strand. But that means, um, as you say, we do have a PCR, right? So we also can capture the complementary sequence of the sense and antecedent strand. So we're actually capturing four times instead of just once. OK. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Ben. Do you have specific quality criteria that must be met to perform CNV analysis with whole exome data? So um, I, I think we had one question about that uh, already. So there are certain criteria regarding uh, sequencing depth, but as, uh, we have also other criteria um, where we monitor consistency across the samples or across sequencing runs. Um, it's a multitude of uh, um, parameters and uh, we, uh, um, during, as, as I explained, during the onboarding process, uh, we provide detailed feedback um, and also the software provides detailed feedback about all these parameters. And we can set very uh, specific uh, acceptance criteria for, uh, for these uh, parameters so we, they can be monitored over time. So it's uh, would probably um, um, uh, go beyond this uh, this webinar to explain e uh, each single one of them, but you can uh, uh, feel. Uh, yeah, I invite you to contact us and maybe test some of your own data, and we can provide detailed feedback. Next one is also for Ben. Can I use historic data from samples that I sequence in the past to perform the CND validation? Uh, yes, uh, you can use historic data. Um, we have to be, um, uh, or we have to take care that the historic data that we're using for the validation is uh, still similar to the, your current um, laboratory process. So it doesn't make sense to use um, a data from a, a previous uh, workflow that doesn't really match in quality your current workflow. That's all, but otherwise we can easily take uh, uh, use historic data for that. Here's another question for Twist. The exons which were captured by Twist but not by other panels, were they random or difficult regions? 
Um, it could be based on the design itself, uh, or was it called um, a target, right? So you can always, if it's not um, including our exome, you can always um, design a custom panel and then spike that into the exome. And it's very simple step in the laboratory, just doing uh, during the hype, you can just pipe at two probes instead of just one, and then um, you can achieve more targets than what's in the current exome. Okay, the next question is also for, for Twist. Can you elaborate on how the probe pool is sequenced for QC? Um, so we use the Illumina sequencer to do the NGS QC. So we can look at the, how was the presentation. Does every probe show up at least once or twice? And then we do provide the QC report when the panel is delivered uh, to the customer. Next question is for Ben. Is the VAVA software compliant with data privacy, privacy regulations like GDPR? Sure. So um, we have to be. As a, uh, since we are marketing in Europe, we have to be compliant with uh, regulation like GDPR, and we are. Then we have a question for Rami. How did you integrate your own variant database into the software? You are mute. Um... So, um, um, if you are talking about the data that we are producing, then it's automatically integrated. Um, it's called um, um, uh, Harvest and Ben, help Alexis? me. Yeah. Alexis. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you are talking about all data, uh, then um, it's not integrated. In our case, it's not a big loss as before we start, we start directly with, with Barvis. So we do not have all data. But I know about people who uh, wanted to integrate all data. So you need to um, upload them as a bunch and um, then integrate them. Um, I think then it is uh, technically possible and easy. I think it's a matter of money, maybe back to Ben. <laughs> well, there are different ways to do that, but. Uh... Uh, we have ways to integrate uh, his historic data or uh, previous uh, databases, either as annotations or as entire um, uh, samples, as entire data sets. Yeah, that's possible. Okay. No more questions in the chat. So um, I would like to close the session. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for all uh, your speakers or speakers presenting their data here. If you have any questions, uh, coming up later, you feel free to contact us. We will also forward the questions to our experts. And um, there are more uh, episodes of the VARVIS webinar series coming out soon. So on the website, you can find out more upcoming um, sessions. Until then, bye-bye for you. now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye, -bye. bye.